Okay, in Romans chapter 11, we're going to talk about part two in the series of Would Not Have You Ignorant. Now, if you paid attention last week, if you were here in Sunday school or if you went back and listened to it, uh, you I, I, last week was about communication and effective communication and how Paul, in his Would Not Have You To Be Ignorant, his first mention of it is in Romans chapter one, and he talks about uh, it being a process of communication. He didn't want them to think that he had abandoned them and how important that is. And I, I got into that real deeply last week in Sunday school. So I'm not going to touch much on that today, but uh, communication is the key, I believe, to effective management, to running a church, to uh, uh, in a uh, effective home, um, a lot of times the kids don't communicate with the parents. A lot of times the parents don't communicate with the kids. A lot of times the wives don't communicate with their husbands and the husbands don't communicate with their wives effectively. And there's a breakdown. <clears throat> when there's a breakdown in processes, people pay for that. And there's often when there's a breakdown in processes, things collapse. And a lot of times that happens with families breaking apart, divorces, church splits, uh, people, uh, businesses going under because there was a lack of effective communication. Now, Ben and I were talking afterwards and, you know, we're both in a position of management for those that are here, uh, in, in management, we often get inundated with emails, inundated with meetings and the meetings are to communicate. And what they do is they take you away from your ability to communicate sometimes because you're so wrapped up in meetings that you can't communicate with those you need to communicate with because of the communication process. And it's, it's a crazy thing. I understood exactly what he says, you know, and for those that are in that position of leadership, sometimes you say, well, we've got so many meetings up here that I can't communicate to those I need to communicate to because of the communication process. So again, Paul acknowledged that. And he said to the people, to the Romans, he said, I, I want to communicate with you. I didn't want to think I had abandoned you. I uh, didn't want you to think that. I was hindered in getting to you. So Paul was a good communicator when it came to writing things down. And this is the other thing Ben and I talked about afterwards, that oftentimes you have the ability to write things down. As he said to me, Pastor, I can communicate in an email. And he said, when it comes to writing things down and communicating, I'm very, very good at it. But when it comes to the verbal part of communicating everything, Ben felt that he said, I fall short on that particular area. And he pointed out to me that Paul, even when he was talking about his speech and about being with them, that his speech was contemptible and his appearance, you know, was was weak. And he he himself might have struggled with that verbal communication one on one. And Paul kind of hints to that in his epistles. Uh, he was an intellectual, obviously. And Peter says even of Paul that his writings were sometimes hard to understand because he was so smart. So sometimes when you have that smarts, you have those smarts and you're an intellectual, you got a high IQ, you might even be a genius. Oftentimes you don't have the ability to, to communicate effectively. You might be a good writer, but you might not be a good <clears throat> Uh, someone that can uh, speak verbally. You might not be someone uh, in order uh, or someone that can communicate that process back and forth when it comes to verbal. So there's, again, written communication, verbal communication. It's got to be effective. And Paul didn't want them to be ignorant of that. So in a nutshell, that was part one. So as we head into part two, we're going to talk about would not have you to be ignorant of the blindness of Israel. And that's where we're going right now. So if we turn to Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, and look in verse 25, we have this. It's the mystery of Israel's blindness. It says in verse 25 of Romans 11, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. So he didn't want them to be ignorant of this is second point lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Okay, 
So blindness, blindness to the nation of Israel, the mystery of Israel's blindness. And we were talking on the corner yesterday, and it seems like blindness is starting to hit the whole world, just not Israel. We're, we're seeing a lot of, and I, I was talking to the men, and we're talking about witnessing and winning souls. Uh, you know, it used to be that you'd give a gospel tract to somebody, at least with me, and sometimes they would start asking questions, or you get the opportunity to take it to the next level. And what I'm finding in today's world is you give the gospel track out and there's no curiosity at all. There's no interest. There's no opportunities to get to that next level to witness to them. And I'm finding that I'm almost forgetting how to win somebody to Christ in the method that I have. Because when you get that opportunity, you're kind of rusty because people just, they'll take the gospel track and maybe say, thank you. But when you try to get to that next level with them, it's very hard. And I'm finding the difficulties in the world today are much worse. It's harder than it is even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. There was an interest. And now it just seems like blindness is starting to happen, not just to Israel, but also to the Gentile world. And this is where we're getting to the fullness of the Gentiles. And you can see the climate in the world. Blindness in part. It's happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And I believe that fullness will, when it comes in, the rapture is going to happen. So I believe that's putting us closer to uh, the rapture and the tribulation because of just the current state of the world. Uh, so Paul did not want them to be ignorant of the blindness of Israel. Now, Christ was crucified, and Israel gave, gave their sentence against him, and basically said his blood be on us and on our children. So when you think about the cruci crucifixion of Christ, the question comes up, who crucified him? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? Who crucified him? Well, the Jews had a part in it, didn't they? Pilate brought him forth and said, I find no fault in this man. And they said, away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And he even pleaded with them, shall I crucify your king? wanted to let him go. They said, crucify him. Three times, he did. I find no fault in him. But then Pilate gave sentence and said, let him be crucified. So it was the Jews who crucified Christ, and it was the Romans who crucified Christ. But lest we think we didn't have a part in it and start blaming people, we need to understand that he was crucified too because of our sins. Our sins put him on the cross because he willingly went there knowing what he was being crucified for. But what does the Bible say about the crucifixion of Christ by the nation of Israel? Okay, now we're talking here about blindness, the mystery of blindness of Israel, okay? So Israel's blindness. Did they crucify him knowing full well all that he was about? And the answer to that is no. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, We get a clarification when Peter is talking here in Acts 3. Acts chapter 3, and let's look in verse 12. Now, this is when the lame man gets healed. It says in verse number 1, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Amen. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, if you know this, he, Peter and John did this openly. And this was a miracle that was done. And you say, well, why were all these miracles done? Why were they done? 
They were done to show the power of God. But they were done to show the power of God to try to turn the nation of Israel to the Messiah. And remember, the Bible says that the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's why we're not in the world we live today. We come and we hear it by faith, don't we? And we hear it by preaching. We don't need to see lame people be healed. We don't need to see the blind restore their sight. We don't need to see those kind of things. We don't need to have healing services. Those kind of things, the signs, and the Jews were requiring that. The Bible says they require one, so God gave them one. And here, after Christ ascends, shortly after Pentecost, this is chapter 3, Pentecost occurs in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they speak with new tongues, the clothes of fire above their heads, and they marvel and say, wow, how do these men, these men are unlearned? How do they speak with these tongues? These are unlearned and ignorant men. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was moving through the signs and the wonders. And then you got here in the next chapter, Peter and John go into the temple. There's the lame man. Everybody watches. They take him by the hand. He jumps up, leaping and walking and praising God. They go into the temple. The nation of Israel has an opportunity. And this is where the preaching right after this, it's not directed to the Gentiles. The preaching is directed right to the Jews, right to them. And they got an opportunity to get the thing right. See, God's merciful. And even though, even though, as it says that we're going to read down here, even though they killed the prince of life, and I find that strange, that killed the prince of life. Like, how do you kill the prince of life? Like, even with Christ's death, he was the prince of life. He was the life giver. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was the life. He was the light. So how did he die? Crazy how the prince of life could die. But praise the Lord, he couldn't stay dead. So kind of funny when I read that. I said, wow, his title, prince of life, but yet he gave up the ghost. Okay. But again, he couldn't stay dead. So it says in verse 9, and all the people saw him. The Lord let everybody see this. And they were Jews. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Now there's a responsibility level. Okay, you require a sign. The Lord, Israel requires a sign. Didn't he just give them one? He gave him a fantastic one. Here's this man who had never walked, and now he's leaping and praising God. There's your sign. Now, what are you going to do with your sign? And this is where the responsibility now goes away from God. God says, here's the sign. I'll do this. But what are you going to do about it? And that's where God is cleared in these things because God gave the people what they needed. And when we talk about blindness and ignorance and you look at Israel today, they could point fingers and say, well, it was God's fault or it was this fault or that fault or whatever. Whose fault was it? In the end, God cleared himself. He said, listen, here's another sign. I'll give you another chance. All you got to do is repent at the preaching of Peter. All you got to do is repent at the preaching of Stephen. Then he give him another chance. He did chance after chance after chance. Then he sent Paul. And finally, Paul said, done. I can't do any more. You refuse it. Your, your, your eyes are blind. Your heart is wax gross. Your ears are dull of hearing. You throw away. You're contrary to the gift that the Lord wants to give you. I can't do it anymore. We now go where? We now go to the Gentile. And that's why Paul becomes the epistle to, or the apostle to the Gentiles. We now go, and his epistles are written to the Gentiles for the most part. Jews had an opportunity. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. <clears throat> for how long? Well, blindness occurs here in Acts. And we get down to verse number 12. 
It says, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people. So here's where the responsibility goes back. God did his part. Peter, as the preacher, says, okay, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, and through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence, see, in the presence of you all. So God did this, and through faith in the Lord, the God of our father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he did this. And he did this for you to reveal himself as the Messiah. It says in verse 17, now look what it says. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. So what's the command? The command is, repent. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So what was it all about? Why did he do this great miracle? Because he wanted to turn the nation of Israel to him. Repent. Accept Christ as the Son of God. Accept Christ as your Messiah. But again, they said no. They said no, no, no. And read the book of Acts throughout the whole book of Acts. No, 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 no. They crucified him through ignorance. They remain to this day in a state of ignorance. So the nation of Israel remains today in the state of Israel. Now, if you said that to them, they would be like, well, who are you? You're some heathen Gentile to tell me that I remain in a state of ignorance. Why? We have the law. It was given to us in the oracles of God, the commandments. They were given to us. We know the law. They don't consider themselves to be ignorant, but they're ignorant of the fact of Christ being their Messiah. They have not accepted him. They're ignorant of the New Testament, and they're blind. And no matter how much you try, it's hard to bring sight to them because they're spiritually in darkness. Paul did not want us to be ignorant of this mystery. So it's not up to us to hate the Jews because of that. It's not up to us to point a finger and say, well, we need to persecute you as some of the nations have done because you killed Christ. And that's always been the excuse when you study the Nazis and various things that have, uh, people that have persecuted Christ or the Jews over the years. Well, we persecuted them because they killed Christ because they're responsible. They're in ignorance. And the Lord understands that. The Lord says that. But one day they're going to they're going to welcome him. One day they're going to accept him. OK, so they remain in ignorance today. If you go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And in all of these ignorance things, when it comes to people, what is the cure for ignorance? What is the cure for ignorance? The cure for ignorance, what's the cure for ignorance for the nation of Israel? I'll get to it. What's the cure for ignorance? To the Gentile world. What's the cure? Okay, I'll get to it in a minute. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is 
that they might be saved. So we need to pray that they would be saved and that God would open their eyes. And you need to keep the Jews in prayer that somehow through all that happens to them, that God would open their eyes and show them. It says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So when they say, well, we believe in God, well, we keep the Ten Commandments, well, we have the law, well, we're the Jews. To us was given the oracles of faith. Abraham is our father. Well, they could say all they want, but they have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. And Paul explains this. Verse number three, for they being what? Ignorant. They being ignorant of God's righteousness. That's the key. It's the righteousness of God. It's not so much the knowledge of the Bible. There are those Jews that know the Bible very well, know the Old Testament, especially the law, very, very well. They have a zeal of God, but they're ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant, and that's what Paul says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ, and this is the reason, they will not accept Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. They're stuck in the law. And this is also where the Muslims are stuck. The Muslims are stuck in the law. The Jews are stuck in the law. They're battling over Isaac versus Ishmael, but they're all under the Old Testament. Blind. They will not accept the new. They will not accept Christ. And to answer the question, the cure for ignorance is acceptance of Christ. We sit here today no longer ignorant because we've accepted Christ. The cure is through Christ. Christ is the end of the law. Thank God. Thank God I'm not up here preaching the law. All of us would have to go home and change our clothes. <laughs> would have to, wouldn't we? I mean, I have a cotton T-shirt on underneath this, you know, and I'm mixing all kinds of different blends. I've got a shirt here that's not 100% cotton. It's got a little spandex in it. I got a vest on that's made of suede and leather, and I got pants that probably have a little bit of nylon or polyester in them. I'm a mess. <laughs> Tommy's a mess. I can tell right now. Tommy, because I know that's a nice L.L. Bean wool sweater he's wearing right there. And he's mixing that with cotton-based pants. He's a mess. <laughs> and Anna's over here chuckling. She's a mess, too. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> She's agreeing with me. I feel a mess. But why are we a mess? Why are we a mess to the Jews? Oh, no, you got it all wrong. You can't mix those materials. They weren't allowed to do that in the Old Testament under the law. But we're allowed to do it today. You say, well, we're not ignorant anymore. No, why are we not? Because we've accepted the one who could bring us out of ignorance. Christ is the end. But Christ is the beginning. He's the end of the law. But Christ is the beginning of a new life. Christ is the beginning of a new creature. Christ is the beginning of a new testament. Christ is the beginning of a new covenant. Christ is the beginning of a new hope. That'll preach. That'll preach. That's good preaching there. Newness in Christ. The oldness of things. The old man. The old testament. The old covenant. The old way. You want some fodder for a message? There you go. That's some good stuff right there. Out with the old. In with the new. As Christians, we can say that. The problem with the Jews, they never went out with the old. They're still stuck in the old. It's not that they're bad people. That's the interpretation. Well, you're telling we're bad people. You're not bad people. Muslims are not bad people. But they're stuck in the old. And it's become tradition to them. They have a zeal for it. And Paul says, it's a zeal but it's not according to knowledge. And anybody, any any religion that's stuck in the Old Testament, you're Amish. Are they not stuck in the Old Testament? Some of your Mennonites, stuck in the Old Testament. 
stuck under, well, got to watch the way you plant your gardens. Don't mix this with that. Don't do this and that. Old. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So if you believe, if you believed, you're no longer in ignorance. But Israel remains in, ignor in ignorance. And this is what Paul said. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. For one, communication. Secondly, the blindness of Israel. But it's not forever. Okay, let's look in verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference, here it is, between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And we, we need to be able to answer this question because have we told them? The Lord's saying, hey, how are they going to know if we don't tell them? And as I said at the beginning of this Sunday school, it's getting very hard because people shut you down. But that doesn't mean that we have to stop. There are still those out there. Somewhere, they're out there and you'll find them. There are still those that want to have hope and want to receive Christ. You just have to keep on pushing. And no matter what, and I know it gets discouraging. I talk to you, Ben. I talk to you, ladies. We talk about how much you witness, how much you pass out tracts. We were talking the other night about how many tracts go out from this church. How many thousands of tracts have been passed out? Yet, with all of those tracts, how many people have we seen walk into this church? Because they got a tract. One or two. One or two out of all the thousands of them. You would think, surely someone. How about it, Brother Koki? How many tracks have gone up just from your hand alone? How many? Thousands. But yet, think, are the tracks doing the work? Hey, don't question. Just go. Just do it. Just go do it. We under And that will keep you going when you understand the climate of today. And understand the rewarding system of God. God just isn't going to say, well, if you don't win somebody to Christ, you can't be rewarded. No. What about the gospel track? You did what you were supposed to do. The Lord laid it on your heart. Witness to that individual. You can't save them. I have planted. Apollos hath watered, right? But God giveth the increase. Only God can give the increase. They just do it. Like 14 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You say, well, you're the preacher. No, we're all preachers. We're all preachers. You're a witness. You're a witness of Christ. That's why be faithful in your field. Be faithful in your field. Whatever God's called you to do, be faithful in that field because you'll get the opportunities to be that witness. How shall they preach except they be sent? And I'd be remiss if I don't read the rest of this. As it is written, you have beautiful feet. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Maybe some of the most beautiful scripture ever penned is right there in the book of Romans. And that Romans chapter 
10 verses 9 through 13 when it comes to salvation. I don't know if there's any other passage that even comes close to the, that's a gospel track right there. That's the plan of salvation in a nutshell. Follow it, believe it, and you go to heaven if you accept what that says from 9 through 13. But Israel, you could preach that all day long and they just won't accept it. They won't accept it. The mystery of Israel's blindness. Notice that the Christ, of course, is the remedy. Christ is the remedy. Let's go over to Acts chapter 4 and Acts 17. Now, I told you I'm going to take my time with this. Acts chapter 4 and Acts 17. We're talking about the blindness, <clears throat> the mystery of Israel's blindness. Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 17. Okay, let's go to chapter 4, and let's look in verse number 13. Let's look in verse 12. Okay, Acts chapter 4, and let's look in verse 10. We're still talking about the impotent man, the lame man that was healed. And they get examined by the elders, and here's what uh, Peter says in verse 10. Be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye, cru whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved." Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. and They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, of course, ignorance oftentimes is associated with rudeness in our world today. If somebody says you're ignorant, that's not a good thing. You know, you're ignorant. That was really rude. You shouldn't have done that. You know, how many times maybe you talk to your kids and you say, hey, what you did there don't do that again. That can be perceived as rude behavior. That was ignorant. Stop that behavior. How many times in school, you know, you have kids that do things to other kids say, boy, they're so ignorant. They're not without knowledge, but they're ignorant in a form of rudeness. Okay. They're rude, but ignorance, it wasn't that Peter and John here were being rude. They said they're ignorant and unlearned men. And of course, the condition of being ignorant is a lack of knowledge in general or in relation to a particular subject, the state of being uneducated or uninformed, okay? A willful neglect or refusal to acquire knowledge, which one may acquire, and it is his duty to have. And I think part two is really important in that definition because ignorance can be willfully, uh, it can be a willful thing, a neglectful thing where a person is, is ignorant on their on purpose, they don't want to know. And I think we, what we have in the world today is that in the world that people just want to remain in ignorance. They want to be blind. They don't want any light to them. They're ignorant. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And any, any light that shines on them will take them away from their lifestyle. And it's unfortunate, too, in the Christian world because we're finding a lot of Christians drifting towards darkness again. And they don't want light exposed on what they're doing either. We're not supposed to be with darkness at all. We have light within us. And we need to walk in the light because we're children of the light. Okay, so we got ignorance here. And then Acts 17, let's go to Acts 17. Notice here that accepting Christ is the remedy for ignorance. Acts 17 and look in verse 22. Acts 17, and let's look in verse 22. I really enjoy this scripture because it shows the Holy Spirit getting a hold of the preacher. And the preacher can't keep his mouth shut. It's kind of like the Jeremiah syndrome, where Jeremiah said, I'm not going to talk about him anymore. But he couldn't stop. He said it was like a fire in his bosom. He just couldn't stay. He had to to open up his mouth or he would burst basically. 
uh, Acts 17, verse 22. You can picture this here. Paul comes into uh, Athens, and he's on Math uh, Athens Hill, Mars Hill up here, and he sees all of this paganism around him. And knowing Paul, it stirs him. Acts 17, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Have you ever been around a company of people where you just wanted to find a higher place, get up on a rock, and just whip that Bible in the air and go, folks, you need to repent of your ways. And in your heart, you're like, boy, you're feeling that urge to just speak out. That's Paul. He stood there. He says, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. He says you ignorantly worship him. You don't even know why you worship him or who he is. I'm going to declare him to you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord, of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, See it, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And truthfully, he isn't. I don't care from the most hardened atheist in the world to somebody that is entrenched in paganism or someone that is an open Satan worshiper. God is that close to them. Do you realize if someone, even someone, let's take someone who openly worships the devil, maybe reads the satanic Bible, maybe does the blood sacrificing to Satan, someone that's so deep involved in that kind of rubbish, that kind of spiritual darkness, if at one moment in their life, they would look and say, what am I doing? What am I doing? I got to get away from this. Christ died for me. What am I doing? And they would turn and they would accept Christ as their Savior. Would he save them? Would he? He's that close. And Paul said, though he be not far from any one of you, If they would have embraced Paul's preaching, they would have, they would have no longer have been in ignorance, would they? It says in verse 7 that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance, here it is, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to what? Repent. There was a time that God winked at the ignorance. God said, turn a blind eye to it. But after Christ came, and after he died, and when he sent Peter and John and Paul, the Lord says, no longer do I wink at this sin. No longer do I wink at this ignorance. No longer do I turn. Now I command all, all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31 says it all. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, one thing I want to say here is, and I started this off with, Paul didn't want them to be ignorant of the mystery of the blindness of Israel. But he also didn't want them to be ignorant of this, that the blindness of Israel is going to last for a certain amount of time. It began when they rejected Christ. And it's still in effect today, is it not? But one day, Paul wanted them to know, don't be ignorant of this fact. And we live right on the precipice, right on the verge, right on the threshold of Israel's acceptance of the Messiah. And in the world we live today, being that this is 2024, and Israel's been in a state of blindness, blindness for almost 2,000 years. The Lord says, one of these days, I want you to understand, Paul said, don't be ignorant of this. Israel is going to embrace their Messiah. And Israel can say all day long, we don't believe that Jesus Christ was our Messiah. We don't believe, we believe he was an imposter. We believe he was a deceiver doesn't matter what they say now one day he's going to show them his hands he's going to show them his wounds and they're going to say to him where did you get those where did you get those and he'd say i got them in the house of my friends and they're gonna and if the jews would ever listen to this message or anybody being a jew Say, i'll never accept christ i'll never do it no matter what you say preacher no matter what I will never. I'm telling you right now, as sure as God lives, the nation of Israel will embrace the one that died for them. The one they call an imposter, the one they called the deceiver, the one they said was not the truth, was not the way, was not the life, the one they denied, they will one day weep and wail as a nation for him and they will embrace him and there will be harmony in the world like you've never seen and it's going to happen because God says it's going to happen not because Pastor Kevin says it's going to happen because it doesn't matter what I say and it doesn't matter what you say it matters what God says because God does not lie and I'll tell you for those that think the future looks bleak we're looking at the politicians and, oh, what happened? Listen, to every one of us, we need to understand this. The future is bright. I don't care how dark the world gets. It will never end in darkness. The Lord will make sure of it. The future for Christians, the future for Israel is a bright future in the end. Now, what we got to go through to get there. But in the end, what a bright future we have. Let's go to, we're going to close this portion, part two, uh, in Romans. Let's go to Romans 11. Romans 11. And then next week, I'll get on uh, another one of the would not have you ignorance. Okay. I have seven of them. I've only covered two. Next week, I'll cover number three. And if I get to number four, we'll do that. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, and look in verse 25 again. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. It doesn't mean that all Jews will not get saved. Some will, some have, and praise the Lord for those Jews that have accepted Christ. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so you're Jew listening to this, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. And that's so true, isn't it? They just won't accept 
the gospel that we preach. To them it's heresy, and to them we're heretics, and we're heathen and we're ignorant, and we're just dumb Gentiles. But I beg to differ. We are saved, and we are washed, and we are regenerated, and we are holy by the gospel that we've accepted. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given it to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, if you want to read more about Israel being grafted in as a wild, wild olive or as an olive branch, as we were grafted in as a wild olive, and then being put back into their own tree, you can read that in Romans 11. God specifically lays that out and says he's going to put them back into the tree that he they were in before, but they had to be cut out because of their blindness. So, again, Paul wanted us to be not ignorant of the mystery of the blindness of Israel. Okay, let's take a break. <laughs> 